from the headquarters of Telesio English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the South, and I am Sweeney Gray. A UN report has confirmed that the countries that signed the Paris Climate Agreement are far from fulfilling their commitments. In fact, the global climate is on track for an increase of 3 to 4 degrees Celsius if countries continue on their present course. An urgent transformation of the world economy is required to avoid global chaos. The report from the scientists of the IPCC says the use of fossil fuels needs to be cut by 40% by 2030 in order to achieve the goal of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Limiting global warming to 1.5 compared to 2 degrees would reduce the number of people exposed to climate-related risks and susceptible to poverty by up to several hundred millions by 2050. Carbon dioxide emissions would need to decline substantially before 2030 to avoid warming of more than 1.5 degrees C in the middle of the 21st century, followed by large-scale carbon dioxide removal. When talking about limiting the impact of global warming, various approaches have emerged on how to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Today we have the Professor of Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the United States, Gregory Nemet, who will give us some insight into the emerging field of negative emission technologies or ways to capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Hello Gregory, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, could you briefly explain to us what negative emission technologies are exactly? Right, so the basic cause of problem with climate change is emissions going into the atmosphere. And usually we talk about technologies like solar power and wind power that would avoid those emissions into the atmosphere. This new set of technologies that we're now talking about are technologies that would remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And that's a big change from what we've talked about before. So what role can they play in climate change mitigation, especially in light of the IPCC reports? Yeah, well, the, the bad news coming out of the IPCC reports is that we're late and we need to do something quite urgently to reduce CO2 in the atmosphere in order to avoid the worst damages with climate change. The good news is that we have a lot more tools at our disposal than we did 10 or 20 years ago. Wind power is cheaper, solar power is cheaper, electric vehicles are becoming feasible. But even those is not enough to do what we need to do to reduce emissions in the atmosphere. The problem is that unlike other types of air pollution, um, like local air pollution that you see in cities, rain and they don't just fall out of the sky in a couple of weeks, they stay, those gases stay in the atmosphere for decades and a century. So if we need to do something about the problem quickly, we need to take CO2 out of the atmosphere directly. Okay, in Latin America, environmentalists tend to prefer less technological solutions, often inspired by the values of indigenous communities who have led the fight against climate change. How do you see that as an alternative? I, I don't see it as an alternative, even though it's an important perspective to include. I, I think the problem is so big and the challenge is so urgent that we need to do everything we can. We need to deploy low carbon energy technologies. We need to reduce our use of energy and use it more intelligently and efficiently. But we also need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And I think we do need to somehow take into account the impacts that might play with ecosystems, with biodiversity and indigenous communities. But I think those are important considerations that can be taken into account. Uh, so we need to be smart how we use negative emissions technologies. And Gregory, finally, what are the obstacles involved in bringing the various negative emission technologies to market and scaling them up in time? Yeah, that's a good question. So part of the issue is that those technologies generally cost something. They're not as expensive as they used to be. And they're certainly not as expensive as the damage that we're likely to incur if we don't do something about it. So it makes sense to do these things, even though they cost money. Right now, there aren't sufficiently strong policies in different countries and at the international level to create incentives for people to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. And that might include planting trees, 
or retaining carbon in soil by doing low-till farming, or it might include chemical processes that remove CO2 directly. But right now, we don't have the incentives in place to reward farmers, communities, companies that will make the investments that are needed uh, to remove CO2 at a very large scale. So that's what we need next, our, our stringent policies to, to incent that. And Gregory, finally, as an environmental professor, um, your president, Donald Trump, has um, taken the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement. Um, and we've heard other um, leaders saying the same thing. How does, how does that kind of concern you? How optimistic are you that countries are going to take the IPCC's warning seriously since we have world leaders who are now voicing doubt, casting um, doubt upon climate change? Yes, that's a real concern. It's a big problem that one of the biggest emitters, the United States, is not taking a leadership role in addressing climate change. Um, so things need to move quickly, and I think that slows things down if one of the largest countries uh, is not taking a leader leading role. On the other hand, we do have, even within the U.S., um, states and important large states that are doing very aggressive actions. California just passed one of the most ambitious climate policies in the world two weeks ago. And New York State, another large state, is doing aggressive policies as well. Texas, another large state, is doing more on renewable energy than almost any other state. So there are subnational efforts happening. And there are other countries that are, are taking the lead uh, as well. And at the same time, the, the challenge of doing something about climate change, uh, the tools are getting better all the time. Solar power is getting cheaper. Wind power is getting more efficient. Electric vehicles are getting far more attractive and more uh, economical than they used to be. So in a way, the problem is getting easier, and that's... Okay, so we have just lost Gregory Nemat, but we really appreciate him speaking to us about this very important issue. Other news now, the Workers' Party candidate in Brazil, Fernando Haddad, has been to visit the former president, Lu Lula da Silva in jail. This is the day after he came second in the first round of the presidential election. After his visit to Lula in Curitiba, Haddad told the media that he wants the forces of democracy to unite for the second round on October 28th around a program of economic development with social inclusion. The Workers' Party has drawn up a plan of measures to boost Adad's campaign in the lead up to the runoff. The plan includes creating WhatsApp groups among millions of supporters to share with family and friends the candidate's proposals and to make him better known. Face to face contact with similar groups to explain the threat of barbarism that the leading candidate, Jair Bolsonaro, represents and explaining why Adad is the only candidate with the qualities and experience to lead Brazil making better use of the PT's website and social media to spread their message. Our correspondent in Sao Paulo, Ignacio Limas, has more. So the first round of the elections is done, with 46% for Jair Bolsonaro, the far-right candidate, and 29% for the Workers' Party candidate, Fernando Haddad. This is the new situation. We'll have a second round on October the 28th between the progressive forces and the ultra-right. Straight after the results, Fernando Haddad had announced that his campaign would start today. His first visit was to Lula da Silva in Curitiba. There he called on the different forces from the center to the left to unite in defense of Brazilian democracy. The question is whether with this the PT will be able to turn around the results because there is a strengthening of the conservative and even military sectors who are clearly opposed to democracy in Brazil, who defend the military dictatorship and who have won a significant number of seats in Congress. And there's also been a rise in hate crimes, homophobic and sexist attacks and so on. So we'll have to see if this call by the Workers' Party to defend democracy with social justice is enough. Last night, a teacher of Capoeira in Bahia was murdered after saying that he had voted for Haddad by a group of Bolsonaro supporters. So this is the worrying situation we see now after the first round of the presidential election. One side calling for freer gun laws, the other calling for social programs and better access to education in the run-up to the 28th of October. We thank Ignacio for that report. So let's take a closer look at the results in the first round. Bolsonaro needed to win 50% of votes plus one to win the presidency. He only obtained 46%, while Adad won 29% of the votes. 
As for the rest of the candidates, the centre-left candidate, Ciro Gomez, remained in third place with 12% of the votes. And the right-wing candidates, Geraldo Ackerman and Enrique Marielles, won 4.7% and 1.2%, respectively. The Sao Paulo Stock Exchange surged more than 6% in early trading. News of Bolsonaro's unexpectedly large lead in the first round was welcomed by the markets. The rise was led by shares in state-controlled companies, which the far-right candidate has promised to privatize. Brazil's currency, the real, also climbed against the dollar. Brazilian political scientist Jao Ferres has said the Workers' Party candidate Fernando Haddad has to reach out to voters outside his party, especially in the center, to increase his chances of winning the presidential election runoff in two weeks' time. They're very hard to digest, as a matter of fact. But, you know, the, the result of the presidential run wasn't that surprising because you know, there was an anticipation of the second round of the election. So the voters on the right all converged into Jair Bolsonaro, the extreme right candidate. Whereas on the left, you had a division between two candidates, Haddad from PT, the Workers' Party, and Ciro Gomes uh, from PDT. So yeah, at the end, he scored 12%. So, you know, in the second round, you're going to have an unified left against a unified extreme right, which is something quite surprising for Brazil. We never had uh, a viable extreme right candidate in the elections over here. For the last seven elections, you know, the second round was disputed between a center-right party can candidate from the Social Democratic Party and a Workers' Party candidate, PT. So this time is different. PT remained, but the center right was replaced by the, the extreme right, which is, you know, reason for concern, I think. Well, I think he has to conquer voters from, you know, uh, outside his party electorate constituency. So he has to appeal to the center, you know, the old uh, formula of capturing the center. He really has to go for it and to, you know, start conversations, negotiations with political forces to the right of PT. Because, you know, the forces to the left of PT are already voting for him, so they have no choice. So he has to actually try to save Brazilian democracy from its greatest threat, which is Bolsonaro, a candidate that, among other things, defends torture, defends, you know, violence against women, gays, blacks, you know, defends the return to military rule sometimes. It's everything that, that is very, uh, you know, threatening to democracy he has in his agenda so i think that adad has you know a huge task in his hands we'll take a short break now more news in a few Today marks the 51st anniversary of the assassination of the revolutionary leader Ernesto Che Guevara. Progressive leaders in Latin America have been commemorating the date. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro celebrated Che Guevara's legacy, saying on Twitter that Che's conviction for the construction of a decent and equal world continues to inspire new generations who fight against the interventionist actions of the U.S. empire. Bolivian President Evo Morales also celebrated Che Guevara via Twitter. Morales recalled that in 1967, Ernesto Che Guevara fought his last battle in Bolivia. He was captured and transferred to La Higuera, where he spent his last hours. We commemorate and appreciate your fight. Hasta la victoria siempre. Our correspondent in Bolivia, Freddy Morales, has more on this very special date. On October 8, the region of Valle Grande remembers Ernesto Che Guevara and his comrades. Many people are marching to the community of La Higuera, where Che Guevara was detained and executed by a Bolivian military officer 51 years ago. The little school where Che Guevara spent his last hours has been turned into a museum. A group of Cuban doctors are currently working in the region, keeping Che's legacy alive by providing medical assistance to the poorest sectors. The Villa Grande region is holding several events in memory of Che Guevara. 
In the area where his remains were found, the local government inaugurated a cultural center. In the city of La Paz, two events are planned for today, one in the presidential palace and another in Plaza Murillo. Authorities in Haiti have set up a makeshift hospital to help people injured in Saturday's earthquake. At least 14 people were killed and 150 others injured in the 5.9 magnitude earthquake. Those most seriously hurt were taken by air ambulance to the capital Port-au-Prince for treatment. A 5.2 magnitude aftershock was felt on Sunday. No additional casualties were recorded. Saturday's tremor is one of the strongest to hit Haiti since the 7.0 magnitude earthquake of 2010, which killed over 200,000 people. Heavy rains have battered Central American countries, killing at least 12 people. The torrential rainfall caused mudslides in Honduras, which killed two children and their mother. The rain destroyed houses and forced thousands to leave their homes. According to local authorities, six people were killed in Honduras and 7,000 were forced to evacuate. In El Salvador, the head of the country's civil protection agency said two people were killed and 10 others injured. In Guatemala, the heavy rainfall has affected eight departments, caused the overflow of rivers and at least one di disappearance. The National Coordinator for Disaster Release has called on citizens to be alert and to take precautions. The authority said that a low-pressure system located in the Atlantic Ocean has strengthened and rain is expected to increase in the next few hours. Rescue units continue to search for an 11-year-old child who was dragged away by the Petacalfa River in San Marcos. Regional and municipal elections took place in Peru on Sunday. Nearly 13,000 authorities were elected from over 115,000 candidates. One of the largest developments of the day was the fact that Fujimorismo lost in almost every single race. Despite the fact that voting is mandatory, absenteeism reached nearly 20%. A festival in Mexico City over the weekend showcased traditional Mexican stories and promoted local values. For some people, it is only tradition. But for the organizers of this event, this festival means much more. They try to rescue the history behind Mexican craftsmanship, music, and food. Mexico has a lot of traditions and culture that must be carried on. That is why we decided to create this festival, to preserve our stories. Epinafio Mendez says that he learned pottery when he was a kid. Now, at 86 years old, it is very important to him to teach his knowledge to new generations. I feel very proud. I feel happy because our craftsmanship and the Zapoteca language are still alive. Among Mexican traditions, music has a special meaning. Young people from the capital have even appropriated the cultural heritage of other regions in the country, like a rhythm known as Son Guerrerense. We found ourselves in this path. We liked it and we wanted to devote ourselves to it. For us, it represents joy, music, playing something that is being forgotten. Almost no Mexican celebration is complete without confetti. The family makes party decorations for Christmas and Dia de los Muertos the same way they were made generations ago. We are very proud when people congratulate us because we still make confetti by hand. In a nation with 61 languages still being spoken, Mexican stories, craftsmanship, gastronomy and music are intangible heritage and they must be preserved. Thousands of students and lecturers in Zambia are protesting police brutality after a female student was killed when police fired tear gas into her room. Vesper Shimosela, a fourth year student at the University of Zambia, suffocated. Another student fractured her legs and spine after she jumped from the third floor of her hostel to escape a fire caused by a tear gas canister. The sheer and professional conduct of the police who acted in a brutal way uh, 
to basically discharge tear gas in a room at that time of the night. As a former student of that university, I know what university life is. I know that demonstrations have always been there. Even more than 30 years ago, uh, when I left university, demonstrations were there. We found them. They will continue. It's the nature of universities. The Spanish gynecologist Eduardo Velo has been acquitted by a court in Madrid in the famous stolen babies case. The doctor was found guilty of faking births and falsifying official documents. However, the 86-year-old couldn't be convicted because the statute of limitations on the case had run out. Dr. Velo was the first person to go on trial for his role in the stolen babies case during the dictatorship of Francisco Franco, where babies would be taken from their mothers and given to infertile families. The Turkish government is seeking permission to search the Saudi Arabia's consulate in Istanbul after a prominent Saudi journalist went missing there last week. The request was made after the foreign ministry summoned the Saudi ambassador for the second time over the disappearance of Jamal Khashoggi. We demand his immediate release if alive. If not, we would like to know what exactly happened to him and the details of what happened. And we demand from the international community to pressure Saudi Arabia and Mohammed bin Salman to tell us exactly what happened inside that consulate. Two former Pakistani prime ministers and a prominent journalist have appeared in court on charges of treason. The case centers around remarks made by the former prime minister, Nawaz Sharif, during an interview with the Dawn columnist, Cyril Almeida, in May. Sharif suggested that Pakistani militants were behind the 2008 Mumbai attacks. The matter has been adjourned to October 22nd. I'm very disturbed over these proceedings against a very uh, noble journalist and professional journalist in the media. Uh, this was his professional job. You can't kill the passenger. It is good the High Court has uh, ordered to withdraw his name from the ECL. But, uh, the court should have also exempted him from appearing before the court. It reminds me of the days of martial law when journalists were tried under treason charges. Very sad reflection on the current uh, political setup. U.S. President Donald Trump says he doesn't have any plans to fire the Deputy Attorney General, Rod Rosenstein, and criticize the Democrats over the Kavanaugh nomination. Now, Rosenstein was in charge of the federal investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016 presidential election. There has been speculation about Trump firing Rosenstein after he made remarks about Trump's fitness for office. The president also weighed in on the Kavanaugh nomination, calling Democrats' handling of the matter atrocious. Sergeant at Arms will restore order in the gallery. Our correspondent in Washington, D.C., has more on the issue. Reactions keep pouring in after Kavanaugh was confirmed to the Supreme Court. Democrat Senator Kamala Harris says this is a great misfortune and shame for the country. She adds that it was a denial of justice for women and sexual abuse survivors. Kavanaugh is accused of sexual assault by three women. After one week of investigation, the FBI announced that it was unable to corroborate sexual misconduct claims against Kavanaugh made by Professor Blasey Ford. Thousands have been calling for that probe to remain open. They demand Kavanaugh step down from the esteemed position. Kavanaugh will be replacing Anthony Kennedy in the Supreme Court, where he was balancing the conservative and liberal votes. Now there are five conservative votes against three liberal votes. We will see how this will influence next November's elections. Also, we need to take into account President Donald Trump's campaign promise to turn the Supreme Court to the right wing. The death toll from Indonesia's earthquake and tsunami has nearly reached 2,000. Authorities say around 5,000 people are still missing, indicating that the death toll could still rise. In Palu, the worst hit district recovery operations have partially ceased. The 7.5 magnitude quake triggered a tsunami devastating the island of Sulawesi. The situation there has improved immensely. We know that in the first three days everything there collapsed. No electricity, no fuel, no cell network, which made it very difficult for us to coordinate. On the fourth day, things improved and kept improving all the way until the tenth day. We've come to the end of this news brief for these and many other stories. You can find them on our website at telesiotv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. 
For Talisman English, I'm Suni Gree. Thank you for watching.